Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Tim Cyclesman Wood, editor of Cycles News and Views on Cyclesman.com. Welcome back to the show, Tim. Hey, Jim. Thanks, as always, for having me. Tim, are we getting the same kind of uh, apathetic, don't really care attitude towards the stock market again? It seems, well, it's climbing. It'll probably keep climbing again. What happened in March, uh, that's a once in a lifetime thing. It, it, is it going to just keep climbing again and, and start setting new record highs? Well, I don't, I don't think so. N- uh, not based on this, you know, the structure and, and the work that I have. I know that there are some people out there and I know that there's, you know, I've seen, I think it's in it. Some Elliott waiver. It's not Bob Prechter because I, I know what he's thinking, but uh, I think there's an Elliott wave count that suggests that there's another all time high left in the market. And, you know, maybe that's true, but I just don't see that. I mean, I don't see that here. Like I said, the structure on February 24th broke. We had a primary bearish trend change. We had the cyclical structure that, that, um, you know, was solidified in conjunction with that break. And, you know, the market was down, um, pretty hard, obviously, and it exhausted itself as it moved into some cycle lows. Uh, the timing on that was virtually perfect. And now we've seen this counter trend bounce. And, you know, I remind people that back in 2008, we saw similar bounces of, of this duration and longer. Um, even in 1929 and through the 30, 31, 32 period, there's bounces. There's always bounces in the 66 to 74 period. There were bounces. And I think that's what this is. And, of course, you're right. It has put people, lulled people back to sleep. And um, I don't think people realize um the importance of what has happened or the risk associated with um, what has happened or the technical juncture that we sit. Now, uh, with that kind of a, a situation facing people, should they be very conservative then? Or is this a case of we've got five tech stocks supporting the S&P and by golly, if I just jump in with Amazon, Facebook and Google, I can't do anything wrong? Well, obviously, you know, we have the situation where with these weighted averages where a few stocks tend to, you know, I won't say control, but tend to be, you know, have a, a, a well, control may be the right word, um, influence the averages heavily, you know, with just a few stocks. So that is a problem. But, but oh, no, I think that this is a time to be very conservative. Um, you know, I'm not giving specific advice, but... When I, if I'm right on um, the phasing of the cycles and what I think lies ahead, when we turn down again, uh, if those higher degree cycle lows are indeed still ahead, then I think we're going to see a much broader base liquidation with this next phase. And so I think what that means is that we will see some of these stocks, some of these holdouts, as you're talking about, um, join the party and um to the downside, and we see, um, I think, even uh, you know, gold and, and gold stocks at that point um, join the party on the downside with a broader base liquidation. But in the meantime, you know, we we have this we have this bounce. Everybody thinks the Fed has saved everything. Um, we're slowly seeing things open back up, and I think people are very optimistic. Is it really true the Fed has your back? If you're in the stock market, nothing can go wrong. They'll fix everything? I think that that is the perception, and I think that uh, as long as that perception works, then it's reality. But in the end, um, you know, it, no, it never works that way. You know, they didn't fix anything 
um, in the 20s. Once the market broke, it broke. They didn't fix anything in 08. When it broke, it broke. And if you think about it, everything they did was after the decline started, and it really fixed nothing. So, you know, as we moved in, the irony of it is, is that as we moved into the cycle lows, the Fed came out with their program to save everything. And so from a, you know, from a, a, a I guess you'd say a layman's perspective, you look at it and say, oh, well, the market bounced because the Fed did A, B, and C. Well, is that true, or did the market bounce because we had some cycle lows? But the fact of the matter is, whichever way you want to look at that, they happened at the same time. And so I think that a, a lot of the control, obviously the Fed has some control on the market because they have great influence, but it's just that. It's influence. They are not going to fix the problems um, that we face if the market is truly broken. If it's truly broken, and I think that it is, then um, you know the, the the structure of the market is going to have its way, and this ginormous bubble that um, I think few even realize that we were in is going to unwind, and it, and that process is just beginning. Is this a waste of money for the Fed to throw trillions at the stock market right now? I, I think so because I don't think I think it's just piling on debt. And I don't think that it's going to fix a thing. I, I I don't. I don't think it's going to fix a thing. Should companies have bought back their shares to the tune of billions of dollars? I'm thinking of the airlines. They bought back 45 billion in shares. I think they're getting 25 billion in federal aid. Should they be getting any help at all? And <laughs> not in my opinion. I mean. If if you mismanage your funds, why should the next person come bail you out? Um, you know we know that those buybacks is is a, a large part of why the the bubble extended like it did, and now they used up their cash reserves and they got their hands out for a bailout. No, I don't agree with that. I don't think the general public agrees with that. But you know, I don't know. You ask me if I do. I personally, I don't. No. Uh, what about cruise lines that don't pay any taxes in the U.S. or Canada? They're all registered offshore and tax havens. Should they be getting handouts? Not in my opinion. You know, the, the thing that, you know, the, the way I look at this whole bailout thing is that, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you look at it on a more realistic level, you know, if you have a little restaurant or, boutique shop or whatever your small business is, automotive repair, whatever, you know, small town uh, America, small business America, and, and you mismanage your funds or whatever the case may be, and you go out of business, there's no help there for you. And so why should the large corporations be any different? If they're mismanaged, they're mismanaged. And, and I agree with that. I understand, even back in 08, how how devastating it would have been if, say, General Motors would have went out of business. But if they can't run their business any more any better than that, then let nature take its course. Let them go. And I just don't think that there should be two sets of rules. But really, I don't think that that as I say that, what I really mean to say is that I don't think any business should be bailed out. If it's mismanaged, it's mismanaged. Let it go. That's the market. Now, uh, one exception might be for small businesses because they employ 72% of the people, I believe, or did, <laughs> going into this. Are, are they the ones more who need the help, the ones who employ well, well, 50 or fewer people? Absolutely, they're the ones that more need the help, but they're the ones not getting the help. Why is it that immediately after the market cracked, uh, we heard, you know, the, the, the large companies are getting the bailouts, but there's still many of the small companies suffering. I mean, I talk to small businesses around my community every day. And, uh, you know, I get out and about and I've talked to these people. I've had them tell me that if, if things don't change real quick, they're not going to be able to make it. You know, they're not getting any kind of help. And, and, and if they are getting some, it's, it's certainly not enough. So, Yes, I agree. If anyone should get help, it should be the small the small business to support because you know that is the backbone. But it's not it's not working that way. In spite of what we're hearing, it's not working that way. At least not from the people I'm talking to on the ground. Yeah, is that perhaps because there's very few photo ops 
when you've got thousands of little shops that provide all the jobs, whereas if it's a major company CEO, you can shake hands with them or bump elbows or whatever they're doing now <laughs> and say, yeah, we got a deal. Well, I think there's a lot more money involved with, with, with the, the big corporations than it is the small shop. You know, I look at, you know, like some of the little restaurants here, the, 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 people that work in you know, like some of the girls that work in, in some of the restaurants that are going to school and, and guys too, but mostly it's, you know, it's women that are waitresses and that sort of thing in this area. And, you know, a lot of them are students and stuff and they're trying to pay rent and they're trying to work. They're trying to make ends meet. They're, you know, I mean, they're, they're good people trying to, you know, just make it through this and they're really suffering because of the shutdown. And so that's, that's very unfortunate. And then you have, you know, fat cat companies who bought back their shares, like you said, taking the handouts and the bailouts, and it's just, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, it's just kind of hard to watch. We'll have more with Tim Cyclesman Wood right after this. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications. Patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Tim Cyclesman. Wood. Tim, the U.S. official interest rate is zero in Canada. It's 0.25%. Are they going to hold the line on that, or are they going to experiment with negative interest rates like they did in Europe? And we can see how well they didn't work out there. I think that, like as always, history shows that actually the market is going to dictate what happens with interest rates. And as I see it at this juncture, the pressure is still on interest rates to move lower in the market. And you know, like I said before, the Fed follows. Um, you know, they paint the illusion that they dictate interest rates. That's part of the. That's part of their. Um, how do I say this? I mean, part of their power is the illusion that they have the power. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And and it, when that illusion works, yes, they do. But at the at the end of the day, as they say. Um, the market dictates the, 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 the direction of interest rates, and they follow, and that's a historical fact. Um, and so what I see now is that, um, you know, uh, rates, are, rates are moving lower, and that's because there's a problem. And, um, you know, as we kind of digressed off of the subject, but, you know, I think that there's hope here. Like you, you said, you know, businesses are starting to open back up. Things are starting to to try to get back to some level of normalcy, which I don't know that we'll ever see the level of normalcy from, say, January or February ever again, but that's another story. Um, but as we tr do try to move back toward that, um, I think that there is a level of complacency. I think that the financial implications uh, of this <clears throat> this whole COVID thing and uh, the unwinding of the bubble uh, all coming together at the at the same time was a perfect storm, and I think what we're seeing is a lull here. Now, how long it lasts, I'm not sure. I think it, it is counter trend. What I'm watching in the uh, you know in the letter, my updates, and that sort of thing is you know just like we needed to see the structure at a higher level set up for the top, which we obviously did. Um, now we need to see this, the le the structure set up at a lower level. For this counter trend top, and when that when that you know when that happens, then um, it's going to leave the market in a very vulnerable position to continue lower in association with those higher degree higher degree cycle tops. Should we, uh, with the market having uh, rebounded quite a bit, then uh, sell, take the cash, hold on to it, and wait for the uh, ultimate bottom out? Well, I think I think that that's the perfect scenario, but how many people would do that? I heard. You know, it's funny you mention that. 
It's funny you mention that. I, I, I would, I, a matter of fact, I'm, I know this person. I may go ask them just out of curiosity, not to give them advice, but just to ask them. But I remember someone in particular. <clears throat> it was a, an ex neighbor I was talking to, and, and they, uh, the guy's wife was telling me how you know how 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 shocked they were with the market decline. And this was right at the March bottom. In uh, you know, I mean, I remember the moment. And uh, she said, "Man, if this thing will just bounce, if it'll just come back, if it'll just bounce, we're gonna we're gonna sell and run." And you know, I wonder if they do that. And you know, I think I know the answer. And I think the answer is no. I think that people, it's come back, and everybody's got a comfort level. They think everything is fine. And the longer this bounce holds, the more comfortable they're gonna get. And then when the downturn does come, then they're trapped again, and they'll be looking for another bounce and another bounce. And that's how the cycles work. That's how. That's what ultimately drives the capitulation in the end as well. And so I think while that's probably the thing people should have done, and I'm not again, I'm not giving specific advice, but I think that's probably uh, would have been the wisest move. I don't think we're going. Uh, I don't think the majority of the people took advantage of of the situation like they probably should have. Uh, are too many people obsessed with this will be a V-shaped recovery? Absolutely. I mean, I think people think, I, I, again, I go back to, I don't think they understand that this is not the same thing that we saw in 2000 or, or excuse me, in 2002 or 2009. It's not, it's not, this is not the same scenario. Um, I, I just don't see this being the same at all. You know, then they were able to reinflate on the back of commodities, um, and and here commodities have actually led. There's and, and without commodities, um, um, you know, without how do I say this? Without some sort of a reinflation of the economy, which would be reflective in the commodities markets, how? What, what I mean, this this economy. I mean, between the job losses and um, uh, what we're seeing. I mean, even going into this top, we talked about how the growth rate with everything was falling off the cliff and contracting, and now we have a continuation of, of weakening commodity prices and the job losses and that sort of thing. No, there is not going to be a reinflation here. Of course, there's a bounce. I mean, we're seeing that, but there's not going to be a genuine reinflation here. Back in 2002, and in particularly 2008 and 2009, we had the growth with China and a demand for commodities and so forth. So there was there was something there that could fuel a, a, a reinflation. Now, what is it? Nothing. We got nothing. We got a broken economy, and the numbers are only going to get worse. Um, no, I don't see a reinflation. We'll have more with Tim Cyclesman Wood right after this. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Welcome back. We're talking with Tim Cycles Van Wood. Tim, is the price of gold going to uh, set record highs again? You know, it may. Uh, I know that uh, you know gold. The, the you know we've talked about that, and if there's one area I've been wrong on, and I, I will I will not try to deny that it's gold, and and it has held up much longer. Than I anticipated the relationships, and I'm not making excuses here. I'm telling you the, the, the facts. The the longer term historical relationships with all the commodity related indexes and stuff that I look at had been telling us that number one, there was no reinflation. Number two, 
that commodity prices were going lower, and number three, that crude oil prices were going lower. And we talked about that, you know, all throughout last year as crude oil prices levitated. They were in counter-trend bounces, just like what we're seeing with equities now. And I maintained, because you asked me just pretty much in every interview or so about crude oil and gold, and I said, no, commodity prices are going lower, 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 lower. They're going lower. And crude oil, we actually saw go negative a week or two ago. I don't know if we've talked since then. I didn't even think, you know, you could see negative prices, but we did. And um, those relationships, my point is, those relationships held true. And we have, in fact, seen commodity prices move lower. And uh, obviously, gold has held up, and it hasn't cracked. But you know what? Those same risks still um, apply. They're still there. Um, I, yes, it's held up. Okay. Um, but those same relationships, I think, will inevitably um, bear their fruit. And so knowing that, I'm sticking with, yes, I think that, that on the one hand, while gold is held up, that it's also still trying to make and probing for that nine year cycle top. And then once that, once the structure finally falls in place and it's back in a, and I'll say this too, it's, it's back right now in a position where that could happen. And if it bites, then I think that gold could, could face the same fate as we've seen in the rest of the commodities market. And that is a tremendous decline. And I don't think people realize that risk because, again, the longer it's defied um, these relationships and longer it's held up, the more convinced people become that, um, hey, maybe this time is different. And I don't think that's the case. I mean, these relationships, they hold over time, but sometimes it can take longer for them to come to pass than you than you anticipate. And every time we've seen a structure try to set up, it never quite bites. And, and, and it was kind of, kind of like with the bubble in equities. You know, it kept on and kept on and it tried and it couldn't set up and it tried and it couldn't set up and then finally it bit. When it bit, it bit big. I think we see the same sort of thing and it's trying to bite now. Again, that's some of the details I'm covering in the letter and the short term updates. When we see that structure fall in place, mm, it, you know, then the risk is on. Tim, uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about it for a while, but can you give us some details about your letter and how people can get it? Yes, cyclesman.com. Yeah, I have, uh, I do a, an update, uh, three nights a week and then, um, you know, a monthly publication, an in-depth publication that is statistical based. I look at a lot of historical relationships and, you know, cycles is nothing more than a method of trend quantification. And if you can quantify something and wrap statistics around it, then you can develop expectations. And then, you know, we also profile the, the, the trends. In other words, the cycles. If a cycle has a certain profile, when I talk about structure, that's what I'm talking about. Um, when the structure sets up with a particular profile, with a particular statistic wrapped around it, then you know that, you know, um, what the expectation is. And so while on the one hand we knew we were dealing with the ginormous bubble, but it never set up, we also identified it when it did, and we knew what to expect. And we've seen exactly what we should have seen in every, you know, in, in, in every asset class except gold. It's been a holdout. And, and uh, like I said, it just, the setup there just hasn't bitten. I uh, firmly believe that it will. And again, everything's being covered. You know, all of those um, um, asset classes and all the structural stuff that I talk about is covered in the in the letter and the updates. Tim, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. My guest has been Tim Cyclesman Wood, editor of Cycles News and Views on Cyclesman.com. If you have any questions for Tim or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com our youtube channel talk digital network find us on twitter at how street we're also on facebook i'm jim goddard thank you for listening comments made on howstreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time Available online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.